his blood never fell with me yet. Never fell with me yet. Jesus' blood never fell with me yet. Good morning. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. Hello. Good day. Good day. Good day. <laughs> yeah. Yes. That's where I am. I can't see you at the moment. Uh, maybe it's ah uh, yes, because my video is not on. Sorry. Okay. Hey. Yep. Wow. So thank you for doing this. I think we um, I think we just talk. You know, after fifty years coming back, coming back to the piece again. How did you? What What were your thoughts writing a choral version? Uh, it, it was an interesting challenge because I I'd done versions. I thought the, the first time I used any voices was when I, when I made the version with, which includes Tom Waits in 1993. And there were some uh, three co co vocal groups in that. And I've used choral groups uh, about with about three or four different cues. Um, and that's because, but uh, a completely a cappella was a new thing altogether. And it was interesting um, because you had to, you have to. Uh, be aware you can't do a kind of you know a pit space and guitar sound unless you're going to be pretend and be rather like some sort of tricksy session singer which is not the, the name of the game as far as i'm concerned you know yeah, yeah, yeah. so i in a way it was re, it, i rethought it a little bit and it became slightly more a mixture of sort of gospel and contemporary music but so you know, have things like the you know the, the humming the whistling that kind of thing just to give it more variety in color um, but one, one danger is always that it would be um, just one kind of sound, and that's what I have to be very careful of. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that a guy in Italy wanted to make a version entirely with guitars, and no right. matter how hard he tried, it just was not enough variety, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, for me, it's the, the layering of sometimes simple, but, but actually when they're, when they're put on top of each other, the, the harmonies are really rich, aren't they? Um, yeah, yeah, they can uh, be, yeah. Yeah, from, well, from, yeah, exactly, from time to time as they build up. Um, and then I think it's the, uh, on the other hand, it's the, it's just the sort of the emotion of, of, of the voice yeah. that, that makes it, uh, makes this version um, just different and, and, and really compelling. I think so. blood. Never fell with me yet. Never fell with me yet. Jesus' blood never fell with me yet. You've heard the old man this singing that loop. Well, it must be a million times or something. I think it, 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 it can't be far off that because I remember when we did the 1993 recording, Michael Reisman, who was a producer, was Philip Glass's uh, producer. Yeah. He calculated we'd, uh, during that period 14,000 times. Hmm. And that was in uh, just for that one recording over a period of weeks, um, maybe it's like almost months. Um, uh, and so it must be at least in, in six figures. Um, and there, there, there are times when I was concerned that I might uh, sort of lose it a little bit. I mean, that was probably the one I was most anxious about was when we did the 12 hour all night one. And I wondered whether that would maybe kill the piece for me because it was obviously physically difficult, difficult yeah. uh, in terms of stamina and, and just energy. And in fact, uh, I think about two weeks later, I was playing in, uh, in the Torino Jazz Festival and we did a small sort of, uh, with my ensemble about sort of seven or eight players, six, six, seven players version, about 25 minutes. And it just felt fine, it felt fresh and uh, I still, when the voice started, I was still, it just still touched me, you know, and it's amazing how it, how it does, you know, you think it ahead of time, or not again, or it's like the, you know, the Rolling Stones singing Satisfaction every bloody week, you know, and, but no, it's, uh, um, it's it, it comes back. Um, so it, it surprises me. I mean, it, I, I never, I've never performed it in a sort of casual way. So if I'm, if I'm doing it, it I, I know I'm doing it. And so I, I am focused. And the fact that there are these sort of like, four minutes or so at the, at the beginning with just the voice it gives you time to get into that zone as it were um and to focus on the voice and to as it emerges from the uh, sort of low level up to the up to level you you do hear all these things it's partly because of the 
the ambience and the raggedness of the recording, these bits of traffic and little bits in the background and the irregularity of his rhythm and so on, it, it, it still occasionally surprises me, you know. So you, okay, so you still hear new things? In yeah, the, in yeah. The, well, I think I hear new things. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I'm hearing something probably in a new way or I, I hadn't yeah. focused on that aspect at one point. Yeah. This one thing I know for he loved me so Jesus' blood never fell in me yet never fell in me yet and so when you did the 12 hour version did you have to completely restructure that or was it, was it oh, yeah, well that with that i did uh, 12 one hour roadmaps uh because we had uh, the thing was organized was, uh, the, the plan was done by some the academy of St. martin and fields the orchestra yeah, uh, and uh, there was another orchestra called the um, what was it called the South Bank Symphonia, which are mostly sort of young professionals and uh, postgraduate students, and then they had my ensemble, which was probably about a dozen of us, and then there were two groups of homeless uh, musicians, uh, a, a, choral, a, a vocal group and an instrumental group, and uh, I conducted the orchestra, uh, but what it turned out with this St. Martin is having decided that it was going to be 12 hours. It turns out that under Musicians' Union rules, they could only play three. So they, so we started at eight o'clock. They could play, play from eight to 11. And they were allowed to come back because of the amount of time that had passed. They could come back and play the last hour at seven. So I thought, oh, great. Thanks for arranging a 12-hour thing where you bugger off and leave me for eight hours in the middle of it. <laughs> uh, but uh, So I conducted the first three hours, and then I joined, uh, played bass in my ensemble. But my ensemble was there all the time, too. My son was playing bass. Um, and um, so, and then there were some members of the orchestra, of, the, of, of both orchestras, who decided uh, that they would personally stay mm. and ignore the regulations. So there were, and it surprised me, really, because you know, these are quite hard bit in London prose yeah. and there was I think the principal cellist stayed all the way through and he was one when we were first just reading it through he was sort of slightly you know couldn't really quite see the point of it but sure. I think it sure. gradually dawned on him and especially after three hours he thought well I'm going to do it and he, and he toughed it out for the whole 12. Um, okay. So and you know we, I, I arranged in terms of schedules obviously I arranged rest periods for everyone within the these hours, you know, so it might be one moment where, say, one of my cellists could have a half hour break and have a, a sleep uh, and catch a bit of sleep. And um, I, I didn't have any breaks like that. I generally would, um, you know, allow myself sort of five minutes to have a cup of coffee and a pee. Uh, yeah. Mostly I was, I was in and out. Um, and, um, and at the end, I was very, very tired. Um, of course, in the middle, there was this thing which I maybe told you about where We've got this message that my daughter's partner uh, died suddenly in the middle of the night. In the uh, middle of that? Yeah, yes. Yeah. And my eldest daughter, who has a young child, she came in the middle of the night to play for an hour so that one of my children could have a rest. Mm. So when she was playing, she got a, a, she came off stage about 3 a.m. She got this text message from my daughter that Julian, she found her husband, a, a partner, dead on the floor in, in the bathroom. He was like 46. And that was in the middle of all this. And so the organizer was saying, you know, do you want to, we should, maybe we should stop. And I said, no, we can't stop. I mean, the, the people that in there, listen, we just have, it was, it was going to be tough. And not many people knew. My ensemble knew yeah. and the organizers knew, but most, most nobody else did. So, and there is a film, uh, that I, the, a short sort of 10 minute film that Sir Martin's yeah. made of the um, of the event and it, it does show uh, the end where, we do, where it finally stops and it, it goes quite then there's the applause and i told her to take a bow and i, I look very tired and it, and i know it's not just tiredness i'm actually emotionally exhausted as well you know so uh, and that's why in a way when we played it again two weeks later mm. it was that also colored the fact of going back to it again you know that's incredible yeah oh my goodness wow. And um, how did, did did you work with the with the homeless musicians, the singers and players? Uh, a little bit, yeah, yeah. There were three groups. For the one group was from Manchester, one from Nottingham, one from London, uh, and they the groups who meet every week with a kind of uh, animateur, and they work on different things. And I went to see some of the Nottingham ones, and it was incredible. I went there; they were working on some sort of chorus from Carmen, 
and they were sort of running about and acting and doing the whole thing. And, they, and these were people, some of them were sort of had serious drug problems and manic depressives, all sorts of people, you know, and uh, it was extraordinary. And so, uh, so there are these organizations that do it. So I worked with them mm. the, uh, and they w would rehearse in the, on their own uh, while, um, you know, in the run up. And um, then we all came together. You know, people were uh, um, staggered by it. I mean, there were people who would stay there for a very long time. You know, so many people would stay for several hours yeah. uh, and just quietly sit, sit there listening. You know, it was um, it was very powerful, really powerful. Yeah, is it is it a religious experience? Is it a sort of no, uh, no for, for me, what is, what is uh, for it? me because for me because I, I'm I'm not a kind of practicing Christian, but no. I was I was brought up as one. I mean, I, uh, I I get the the sort of spirituality of it, and also the emotional side and the kind of uh, the sense of uh, kind of humanity and the dignity of uh, all those things, which are different kinds of abstractions uh, to uh, being religious. Obviously, not a classical religious work at all. No, but no. but it's tapping into it's tapping into our you know the spiritual side of of yeah. of us as individuals, and it's just this very the experience which i guess goes back to what you described at the very beginning when you first looped the old man and you yeah. you you know you witnessed the reactions of the people in the in the, in the, in the room the main yeah. room it's it's touching on something in inside us that is uh, obviously very deep and 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 raw I mean, it's rather like, uh, if one wants to say, sort of a uh, religious experience would be to witness the suffering of Christ. Uh, when you uh, hear this, old, when I heard this voice, old man's voice for the first time, I heard an old man dealing with suffering and dealing with a, an incredibly difficult life. But his behavior in those circumstances went beyond what would be the natural re response. He didn't sort of deal with the pain or complain uh, or, or, be, be, or weep. He was dignified. It was even slightly upbeat. And you, I can hear optimism in his voice. I can even imagine that he was actually smiling as he sang so which is the opposite of what you would expect in his situation yeah and that in a way that that, that so the observation of someone if you like transcending their uh the the what, what would be their lot as it were yeah. is, is immensely touching and you're drawn into that because it's something which you wish you hope you could do yourself i mean we all hope that when ultimately we face death we handle it well we don't know. And in a way, this is, I don't know, in fact, from all the evidence, the old man was not long to, to live. He was, in, he, was, he was old, in the late 70s, it could have been 80. Uh, but he was the only one out of all these people uh, who were recorded who didn't drink at all. So he was, his, his life was, it was um, a tough life. It was not something in, caused by ex something external like drink or drugs. How, how did you go about sort of assembling all those different um harmonic colors for the well the first, I mean, the first thing i did was just to work out what the basic um, harmonic sequence was uh, you know what, what is it what are the yeah. cadences uh, that that was it and then uh, having done that it, it's a fairly straightforward one i mean the, the, I, I could have harmonized it in a slightly different way because there was obviously there was no harmonization as he sang it he was singing it as a single line but that one seemed to me to be the most likely uh, and also the one which had the most sort of pull because of the little sort of chromatic twist in the middle it sounds like he has perfect pitch or something or that he has a very very strong memory of of things being sung i don't know whether it's just a matter of luck that it did happen to be he was in tune with me at my piano but maybe he did have perfect pitch you know he, he is spot in a major you know absolutely yeah. no way yeah, yeah. um and uh in, the, in fact that probably that very fact 
that encouraged me to go a little bit further because I, I, I didn't have to imagine or pitch bend or do anything to, with it. I didn't have to do anything with the tape at all apart from just secure it as a loop because obviously yeah. the tape itself is fragile. But apart from that, I didn't have to do anything, no manipulation. I didn't do anything, any treatment to the voice at all. I didn't sort of try and clean it up or compress or anything like that. Yeah. And and just on the on the loop thing, so because I'm I'm sure a lot of people won't actually even uh, know what that involves. But so you're you're literally taking the the piece of tape, is it a quarter inch tape? Yeah, probably wasn't it. And then and then yeah, it's on it's on it was, it was on a, a kind of a, a Revox um, um, a tape machine. Uh, the tape machine uh, had actually uh, had been loaned to me. It was it was with my, my name was the, uh, the improvising saxophonist Evan Parker. He had the next room uh, to me on in this sort of uh, building, and and he'd been left this tape recorder by the bass player Dave Holland when he'd gone to join Miles Davis. So it was Dave Holland's tape recorder that I heard it on. But it was a it was a quarter inch tape, and in those days when you edit, you simply do cut it with a razor blade, mm. and it takes real courage because you can certainly mess it up. Whereas digital editing is child's play. Yeah, but so yeah. I physically, uh, and then you you join it together with a, a, a simple tape, which which will not sort of um, give a little bump or a click when you go when it passes the tape head, uh, yeah. and it will simply go round and round and round. And and the tape loops, were one of the, the ways we used to get sort of echo and re reverberation systems by having, um, you know, playing something into a, a tape recorder and it being recording, and then coming out sort of like. A couple of seconds later, you know, it depends on the tape speed. If you're doing 15 IPS, 15 inches of tape is is a, a second, you know. So there we know, you know. Yeah. Um, so t those physical loops were something which uh, a lot of us were using in, in that in the sort of through through the late 60s and early 70s, uh, yeah. and then of course as uh, uh, you know, analog disappears. The little blocks you have that had various angle cuts. You could do a, yeah. lo a long oblique, or you know, the, I think. Maybe two, three or four different ways you could do it. The one was straight, and the others were different angles. Yeah. So, so do you remember what you what you did? Was it? A, it must have been. Mine, mine, was, mine, mine was a sort of like a, a sort of like a forty-five degree angle. So it's yeah. like a, just a, just a, a, a diagonal. So it was a fairly common technique. And uh, then you recorded that onto. Because obviously the original tape's not going to last forever as well. Well, no, it, that's that's what that, that's why. Uh, I mean, I I, I I I had the tape at home, and I was teaching in you know, I was in, in London, Kilburn, and I went I went to Leicester where I was teaching the, the next day. I, this would have been a Sunday when I guess when I listened to it. I went up to Leicester on a Monday, and I had this piece of tape in a in a, a little plastic bag in my briefcase. So it, just, it wasn't it wasn't it was it was already a loop. Uh, and because I, I looped in order to, to listen to it and also to sort of play around with it. Uh, and but then I realized I couldn't do this for m much longer. So because we had a, a rudimentary recording studio, we had two or three different uh, tape recordings of this kind, uh, I could set the loop going on one and copy it onto a, a reel to reel tape so I could get a half an hour safe recording of it. And that's when, once I established it, it was working. After about ten minutes, I knew I had another twenty minutes. I had time to slip down for a cup of coffee, and that's when I came back and I found the situation uh, in the room had changed with all these people sort of uh, they've been very subdued and so on. Amazing, this is actually fifty years ago. Yes, uh, the, yeah. I mean that that it would be fifty years ago that I actually did that because, but the first time we, I performed it live was December seventy two. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but I did make a, a, a rudimentary recording of it in 71 with just with um, a, a studio, uh, the guy who used to do a lot of work with us, maybe about a dozen uh, friends. So I think Cornelius Scardi was playing cello yeah. uh, and Chris Hobbs was playing bassoon. It was uh, John White was playing tuba. It was all those composer performer friends and we did put it together. That recording is a very rough one. Uh, I, 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 I have it somewhere, or at least it's archived somewhere. And then I, I played it live uh, in, the QEH in December in 1972 and then I played it in various places and each time I played it there'd be maybe another group that may, I might have say a, a couple of saxophones or somewhere I'd, I'd have an instrument I hadn't had before and so little by little I had all these different versions of little ensembles so that's why when Brian Eno started Obscure Records we put together a kind of orchestral version a simple orchestral version we simply had like four horns, brass quintet, and so on. And 
because obviously we didn't have those players in our uh, experimental music community, I simply hired, we simply hired professionals to do it. Mm. And, as it and as it happened, you know, the people who played at the, on that, those sessions uh, uh, didn't like it at all. They just simply didn't get it. Right. And right. Um, so much so that at the end of the session, we, the whole thing was done in one three hour session. Um, they just left, left that invoice on the table and um, they asked that their names should not be used on the album liner notes. So if you, when, if you see, ever see that, uh, the, that piece, and in fact, it's reissued on my own label uh, CD. The, the listing of players is very odd. Yeah. There are instruments you hear, but there's nobody, there's something called, I call something like the Gateway Ensemble, which is a theater in Marylebone. And, uh, but that was, a, that was a catch all for all yeah. the people who didn't want to be involved. And you have like one bass player, one violinist as you play, you know, it's really odd. Yeah. Maybe they regret it now. Because they said it would damage their career to be associated with anything like this. <laughs> when I was in 93 in New York, yeah. I, I had yeah. sort of the, the, the principal violin of the New York Philharmonic. And all these people, and they all, even there was a guitarist who um, probably almost every other day would call in to make sure we spelled his name correctly. You know, it was completely the opposite. <laughs> you know, it, it really it was unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. Very funny. That is, yeah. And what did you so so when uh, so when I started sending you the the rough versions of of the of this new choral version and well first of all what did you think but then can you remember how we kind of just we tweaked things and what were the things that you were sort of listening out for and, and wanted to change? Um, I can't remember precisely. I mean, the, the, it was it was always very small detail um, and the, the, there was really. It was all fine tuning. Was, I think there's nothing to change at all in principle. Uh, no, I think it was it was some of the it was the the speed of some of the fades. And, yes, I think and, how fast people fade in, yeah. and and I think it, it, it makes a difference. I think when the very first time in the first part of the piece, I think the fading needs to be fairly slow. But later, if you do a slow, too slow fade, it makes sense because you. You, somewhere halfway during your first entry, you need to be heard. You don't have to sort of come in bang, but you sort of glide in. Uh, and so the pace of the, uh, the the fade in and fade out changes, uh, that kind of thing. And and how uh, how high you go, it's somewhere between a, one of those odd dynamic areas between MP and MF, <laughs> if there is one, that's where it yeah. is. It's a yeah. real middle of the road, you know. Yeah, but with that slight kind of slight spotlight on the new ideas once they've yeah. faded up just for a so bit. So you need, you, need you, you need to be aware that something has changed and that you don't have to make a huge sort of crescendo diminuendo, but its presence should be felt and it will be felt because there is a, a different character, probably harmonically or the combination of voices gives it a different color and you will be aware something has changed. For our singers singing those parts and you know repeating them but out of context yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it must have been so strange just very hard i think it's it, it's great it's all come together it's absolutely fantastic really absolutely delighted what did you think when you heard the quote of well his his version of whatever that song is that him um or that, that he made up what did you think when you he heard that as part of my piece for the first time it was a real surprise. It's a real surprise, and uh, I, I thought, "Wow, I had no idea." Uh, and it's um, it was uh, it was quite a shock, uh, but a really nice one. Uh, you know, it, it was not an unpleasant surprise. I thought, "Gosh, I'm hearing it now." Something I'd heard for more than fifty years. I'm hearing this in a completely different situation. Transience is is about this 16th century canon from the from the Eton Choir, but really, and ex expanding that. But it just but it was written to go alongside your piece uh, in, in the in the in the concerts, and and then I was I was just writing it, and it just occurred to me that oh my goodness, there are these 
there's this connection. Well, a with the obviously with the with the text and so on, but 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 actually musically there was this there were these things that were there were these connections Jesus blood that will hopefully hit the audience when they hear it that. It will be it will be a surprise, absolutely. Which is I think it's terrific. Gavin, it's been it's been really good to uh, to, to chat again after I don't know thirty something years, possibly. Yeah. <laughs> And yeah, let's let's hope lots of people get to get to hear this new version and, uh, and experience it because it's yeah, it's really very special. Thank you, Andrew. Never found me yet. Jesus' blood never found me yet. This one thing I know for he loves me so. Jesus' blood never found me yet. Never found.